I greet you in the name of Jesus, our crucified Messiah, risen Savior, and ascended Lord. And I welcome you to our time of worship today. Wherever you are in the world, it's lovely to have you with us today. We continue our journey through Lent and our series on a path to spiritual growth based on the book by Richard Foster of Celebration of Discipline. But before, before we go any further, I want to mention a word of thanks to Delm and Ken for their discipline of regularly giving of their time to bring us these services and sermons every week. I, along with all of you, have, watched, have viewed them with great pleasure and received great blessings from them. And so Delm and Ken, thank you so much for the effort and time you have put into it. It has been a great blessing to all of us. And we go on as we light our candle. And as the candle lights, we say a prayer to our Father. Heavenly Father, you are the creator and sustainer of the universe. Your glory is displayed in the beauty and immensity of creation from the mighty galaxies right down to the tiniest creatures. Your nature is seen in the person of Jesus, full of mercy and compassion, reaching down and touching the lowest of the low, dealing with our sinfulness by offering your life, seeking to restore your rebellious children. This light signifies for us the light of your love shining in the darkness, guiding our path back home to you. Amen. This week we are tasked with a, to think about the discipline of worship. What an awesome subject to fit into 20 minutes of sermon. There's just so much to think about. And we're going to start this morning with uh, looking at what is worship? What is it? And to begin our thoughts on that, I want to start with an idea of pagan worship. And I'm going to use the first person because it's just kind of easier for the grammar for me to do that. On the discovery that I was not in control of the elements of my life, and that there was a power or powers greater than myself that were at work in, in the world, I sought to see if I could manipulate those powers and that power to get what I wanted by following a set of rituals that I created and rules. So if I just got it right and did the, the rituals correctly and obeyed the rules, then I would be blessed and have a productive and comfortable life, which is what we all want. Biblical worship, of course, is slightly different to that. It is the worship of a single, personal, and holy creator who is active in his creation and in the lives of his people. He is known to us as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and was given the name or took the name himself of Yahweh or Jehovah, translated, I am who I am. And we worship in response to who God is and what he has done. Our worship is an outward expression of the thankfulness that we feel in our hearts for our God and what he has done to us. It is also a surrender or a submission to God and his will. And it's involving the whole of the person, all of body, mind and spirit, which I will often refer to as heart. Uh, encompassing that whole person. And this worship can be done either in isolation, alone, or most often in the community, community with others. Having had a brief look at what biblical worship is, just a thought about the purpose of worship. The theologians will tell us the purpose of worship is to glorify God. But I think that may, is to make ourselves uh, aware of God's greatness and his holiness and make that greatness and holiness available and, and spread it to other folk as well. 
It is also intended to strengthen and empower us for living as God intended us to. Because ultimately, all worship is in fact for our own benefit. And now we will move on to our reading. Today's reading is taken from John 4. And it is Jesus talking with a Samaritan woman. He's disciples had gone into the town to get food and we'll read from verse 4 to 15 and then from 19 to 26. Now he had to go through Samaria so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus tired as he was from the journey sat down by the wall. It was about noon when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with the Samaritans in those days. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would give, have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw from the well. We now continue from verses 19 to 26. She carried on. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Here ends our reading for today. In that reading which Ken read so beautifully for us, just a few thoughts as we go on. The first one is that Jesus declares himself as the Messiah. One of the very few times in the Gospels that he does that. And he is, as the Messiah, the visible image of our invisible God, who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, as the Messiah, offers his life for us and therefore he is worthy of worship. He addresses the issue of where to worship at the, at the woman's question about the mountains and he unrestricts for us the place of worship, not on this mountain or on that mountain. The Samaritan and the Jews differed greatly in their interpretation and understanding of where they should worship. The Samaritans preferred the place where the ark was originally positioned, at Shiloh, and then later it was removed to Jerusalem many years later, and the Jews preferred to worship there. And this was a, one of the fundamental differences and areas of conflict between the two groups. But we now can worship wherever we like, at any time of the day or night. 
There, of course, is benefit of worshiping, worshiping at a place of worship where we come together. It helps us disengage from the world and the troubles of the world that oppress us so much and helps us to focus on God. And then he goes on to say that the time is coming when people will worship in spirit and in truth. Now, the, the full understanding of that is probably so wide that we could never encompass all of it. But my little few thoughts on it, which were, are probably just a part of the whole truth. The first thing is that our worship is not a physical ritual or obedience to a set of rules. It is an encounter with the Spirit of God during which we become more and more aware of His true nature and our nature as well. God is holy, all-powerful Creator and a loving Restorer and we call Him our Father. We, on the other hand, are rebellious creatures or children in great need of restoration. We are also become in our time of worship aware of our restored nature that God has given to us as a gift to the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. This worship in spirit and in truth, it is a, it is a heart worship, including our body, mind and so spirit. It's a response of thankfulness, of thankful surrender to God. And in that place of surrender to God, we find that our prayers are no longer simply requests for God to do something and give something to us. But our prayers begin to take us from where we are and what we want to what, where He is and where He wants us to be and what He wants us to do. From my will to not my will, but your will be done. And this encounter with God can happen at any time, at any place, alone, or in community. And now we will follow from that and begin to look at what is our preparation for coming together as a community to worship. The book that we are using to guide us is entitled The Celebration of Discipline. And so we need to just spend a moment as we draw to the end of our service of the discipline of worship. What is the discipline in worship? Uh, the first thing is having regular times for personal worship and regular gatherings for community worship. The writer of the Hebrews urges us not to give up meeting together because it's important for us to do so. The other aspect of the discipline of worship is worshipping when we don't feel like it. Uh, we all have had times when we wake up in the morning and think we, it's, it, on Sunday we're due to go to church and think, oh, I don't really feel like it today. But I've heard so many folks say that those are the times when they've felt most blessed when they're at worship, when they have made an effort to get there. The Lord just seems to appreciate that and touch them so much more. And then, of course, we come to the thought about the sacrifice of praise, where we praise as a sacrifice. And I think one of the wonderful examples of that is Paul and Silas in Philippi, when they had been hauled in front of the courts, found guilty on a false charge, beaten and thrown into prison but at midnight finds them not mumbling and grumbling about how tough life is, but it finds them singing hymns of praise to the Lord. And while they're busy doing that, there's an earthquake and they are released from prison. Again, uh, Peter and John, uh, earlier in the, in the book of Acts, chapter 4, where they had been hauled in front of the religious leaders and questioned and queried and, and beaten for preaching the gospel of Jesus. They returned to their companions in their home and they didn't mumble and grumble, but they praised God that they were privileged to be able to, to suffer for, for their faith. And they go on to, 
to go on and, and ask God for, for strength to continue the work that they're doing and they go out and continue to preach and s spread the word boldly. Another aspect of the dis uh, discipline of worship is submitting to the authority of God. One of the things I think that we find most difficult because we always want to be in control. To consciously lay ourselves open to the influence of God as we worship. Surrendering our, ourselves to His will. Not my will, but your will be done. And then allowing God's Spirit free reign in our hearts to guide and direct us. And as Jesus put it when He was talking to the woman, He said, I'm offering you living water. And this surely is the living water He was talking about allowing God's Spirit to come and dwell in our hearts and to reign in our hearts and to guide us into the things that He wants us to do and live the way that He wants us to live. Drinking the living water, probably what worship is all about as we come before Him in, in sacrifice, as we come before Him in submission to His will, to worship Him, to acknowledge who He is, acknowledge our sinfulness, and receive from Him the forgiveness that He so freely offers to us. And so that brings us to the end of this time of where we're looking at worship. It doesn't cover everything, it could never do so. But as we, be, as we close, we will just finish with a few thoughts and then we will close our service then. Just a final thought for you as we close our service today. Worship is not a duty. It is the joyous response of surrender to the love of God. Now as we go our several ways, may the worship of God be in our hearts until we gather again. Amen. Thank you.